In this prescriber training video, we're going to cover reviewing reports and report interpretations. Specifically, we're going to cover explain the graphs, explain our report calculations. On top of that, how you convert those two into a sound clinical decision making. Finally, we're going to also spend a little bit of time on each of these topics, imbuing the conversation with clinical context. Here's an image of our complete report. It's broken up into a series of graphs. The first or the top is oximetry. The second is heart rate. These two channels are generated from a wrist pulse oximeter the patient wears during the test. Uh, the oximeter is a Bluetooth device which sends it wirelessly to a tablet that has our app installed. Uh, the third graph is bruxism. Fourth is snoring and uh, body position, you'll note that uh, the color of the graphs are striking and they indicate the position in which the patient is sleeping. This is broken into uh, red is supine, green is left, yellow is on your stomach or prone, uh, blue is on their right side, and dark gray is up or propped up. Okay, and then finally there's a calibration that we do associated with bruxism, and we'll talk about that in the bruxism graph. So the first graph, oximetry, or blood oxygen levels. The SpO2 analysis graph, you can see the first thing that you'll see here that jumps out at you are the colors of the graph, which again are associated with or indicate the position in which the patient sleeps in. You'll also notice it's a little bit obscure due to the uh, graph, but uh, you'll see the dotted blue line uh, behind all those oxygen desaturations. That dotted blue line is meant to give you a kind of a sense of where these oxygen desaturations are. It's drawn at 89%. And then you'll notice around the graph, uh, for example, on the right side of the graph, there's, there's two values there. There's a minimum and a maximum SpO2 value. In this case, it's 99% is the max, and the minimum is 77%. Underneath the graph, we have three bins, the first of which is called time of study at or below 92%. In this case, it's 31%, indicating that this patient's spending quite a bit of time uh, at the lower end of the normal range of oximetry level 92. The middle bin, time of study at or below 89%, is at 12%. Uh, this number should be a low single digit on an, in, under normal circumstances. And at 12%, this is highly indicative of somebody that likely has sleep apnea. And then finally, the third box there, time of study at or below 85%, this number should always be zero. Uh, any value here is a red flag and almost always indicates that the patient should be sent to a sleep lab or be diagnosed uh, using the intervention of a physician. So this graph is highly indicative of a somebody who has sleep apnea. And the graph underneath, the smaller graph I have underneath is what a normal SpO2 graph would look like, just so you can have the context of what, this is kind of a dramatic case of uh, severe oxygen desets. This is the, the smaller graph is what a normal oxygen desaturation graph looks like. Here we're going to zoom in on a normal uh, SpO2 graph. And the reason that I wanted to zoom in on this is we're going to introduce artifact recognition. We're doing long studies, and it's not unusual to pick up artifact on any type of study that lasts five, six, seven hours. So we need to make sure we don't let our judgment be affected by these artifacts. So we're going to talk about how to identify them. So in this case, there is value, the lowest value it's picked up by the software is 83%, which is very low. That's, that's a significant low value. However, if you look at the graph, that value is actually an artifact. And there's two things that should, should view off on this. First is uh, that value there, that part of the graph, that it, it's kind of well below anything in the neighborhood. And, and the way oxygen desaturations generally work is they come in clusters. So it's, it's rare that you see normal, 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 severe, normal, 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 which is, is, which is kind of what we see here. So that's one clue. The second clue is when you look at a patient that's in between body positions, so if you look in that section of the study, it's green, red, green, yellow, 
black. So this person's moving around. So that's, this just tells us, okay, this patient's trying to get comfortable. As soon as they get to their stomach, you can see that the, the graph normalizes. If 83 is not the normal or the lowest value, what is the lowest value? A little farther in the night, we see there is a couple of DSATs there. One is about 89%, maybe 88, looks like 89% I wrote there. So that is actually the low value. So when we're dealing with any type of long study report or data acquisitions, it's a good idea to have some sense of being able to recognize artifact, okay? The second reason for this report is, uh, I just mentioned time of study at or below 92%. And I indicated that that should be the low, low double digit, probably single digit. And here we have a value of 34%. And I'm calling this a normal graph. So when I mentioned at the beginning, we were talking about the context. This is an example of context. This patient here is a 76 year old patient and his baseline oxygen level is about 92%. So maybe 93%. So a lot of his time is, is around 92%. That's not because he's desaturating. That's because he has a relatively low baseline value. But for a 76-year-old, it's actually not that, that low. It's you know, not bad at all, actually, for somebody that's 76. So be sure to take into account the baseline, the patient's age, before we jump to conclusions that, oh, this patient needs to be seen by a physician because 34% of the time they're at or below 92%. That's not the case in this particular context, okay? Now we're gonna talk about heart rate, which is the second graph in our reports. And there's a couple of variables that we need to talk about. One is bradycardia, uh, 40 beats per minute or lower. Tachycardia, which is above 100 beats. Oftentimes you'll hear the term bradycardia associated with somebody who has sleep apnea. That's a relatively normal response to an oxygen desaturation and buildup of CO2. That is to say, when a person has an apneic event, they're depleting their oxygen in their bloodstream, the heart tends to slow down during this period of time, and then there's some type of heroic gasp or the airway pops open, and then the heart speeds up in order to, to reoxygenate the blood. Oftentimes we see Brady tachycardia, in a patient that has oxygen deprivation. And what's happening is they're holding their breath, depleting their oxygen supply, the heart slows down. And then when they have a breakthrough breath, the heart speeds up to quickly get that uh, oxygenated blood to the tissue. So this is Brady tachycardia seen with oxygen desaturations. It's a normal response. So in that sense, that heart rate variability, Brady tachycardia in this case, is normal. We want to see that. That's the body doing what it should be doing when, when it's depleting itself of, of oxygen due to an apnea. Okay, so this is the type of response we want to see. And when you see somebody with an oxygen DSAT and their heart rate goes up, that's, that's what you want to see. Now we're going to look at a couple of heart rate that is normal. Okay, uh, so a heart rate graph that's normal. We see that in this case, there's a little bit of artifact here. Again, I'm always going to tip you off that there sometimes is artifact and sometimes you have to sometimes you have to distinguish between artifact and real data. In this case, we can see there's three or four spikes there that are kind of sticking out out of nowhere. And uh, so we know that those are artifact. In this case, it really doesn't have an impact on what we would say about this patient's heart rate. There's a little bit of tachycardia, but again, that's very likely due to the artifact. So this patient's heart rate range and variability looks normal in response to what we expect to see. All right, so now what we're going to do is talk about, let's see what the heart is doing in conjunction with the SpO2. So we're going to look at two graphs together to make sure that we are seeing what we would expect to see uh, to rule out any, any possible symptoms or signs of other uh, comorbidities. Okay, so the first thing that we see here, I'm going to point out on the SpO2 analysis, there is a DSAT or two there. And then if you look at that black arrow that's kind of giving you a timeline, you'll see an increase in the heart rate there. Uh, you would want to see that. The patient has a oxygen desaturation, the heart rate responds in kind. That is a normal response. So that's an appropriate 
heart rate response to an oxygen desaturation. This next graph we're going to talk about is not the case. So this graph is first and foremost, there's obvious that this patient has high likelihood of sleep apnea. You can see the dotted blue line is almost obscured by all these oxygen desaturations. And this is a good example of somebody that should be sent to a sleep lab or diagnosed a, device, a medical diagnostic instrument, okay? But we can learn more about this patient on top of that. So on top of that, we see that the patient and their heart rate is actually, there's a fairly narrow range, 50 to 79. So on the right-hand side of the heart rate graph, you see the min and the max. The minimum is 50, the max is 79. But interestingly, look at the min and the max of the heart rate, or I'm sorry, the SpO2. The blood oxygen level is 99 and 77. So the black arrows on the graph are indicating very low DSAT. So in the section, the blue section there, the patient's desatting below, it's hard to see, but I'll tell you, it's, it's around 80%. And their heart rate is 74. And in no way, shape or form is this normal. Uh, when a patient's blood oxygen level is below 81%, their heart should not be at 71% or 71 beats per minute. It just shouldn't. It should be uh, either really low or really high, depending on where we're at in the, in the heart rate cycle. So this is not appropriate. So what does that mean? What does it mean when you see it with a patient with severe oxygen desaturations and an inappropriate cardiac response? typically means that the patient has had sleep apnea for a very long time and the response mechanism designed to protect against this type of uh, syndrome is no longer functioning properly and this patient should be a special care should be taken that this patient get managed by a physician there's a number of, of medical comorbidities that are associated with this condition okay so when you see this not only should you encourage the patient to get to a sleep lab immediately let them know on top of that, there's reason to believe there's medical comorbidities that are being uh, exacerbated by their sleep apnea. Okay, let's talk about the next graph, which is bruxism or parafunction. And there's a few things we need to explain because we spent the most time here at DDME developing this, this component to our report. The first thing that I will tell you is that we do a calibration. So while the patient's awake, right before they go to bed, we ask them to bite down as hard as they can a few times, and we measure the strength of how hard they can bite down when they're asked to do so, and we save that value. And in our report, the waking calibration value is 102 microvolts is our unit of measure. And we measure this by the surface EMG sensor placed on the patient's masseter. Uh, right after they do their calibration, they click start study and they go to sleep. And we measure the parafunction on two vectors, frequency and strength, while they're asleep. So with regards to the magnitude or strength, when they're asleep, we, the higher the spike on the graph, the stronger the clench or grind. In this case, the strongest that we measured while the patient was asleep, which was the uh, study max force, uh, that value is 105. Okay, so the night max force, 105. So this patient clenches or grinds about the same when they're awake as when they're asleep. So their magnitude is about one. Uh, we like to say anything above one is, you can point out to your patient as indicating that, you remember when you did that cal? You're actually clenching or grinding a number of times during the night at about that same strength. And so that's something that you can confront your patient with if you have trouble convincing them they have a problem with, with clenching or, or grinding their teeth. Because a lot of people, you guys know, will say, I don't do that. Maybe I did it in the past, but uh, not now, certainly. So this is a way to help them understand that they do have a problem. Now, with regards to the bins underneath the graph, the bruxism analysis graph, we break the, those bins represent number of, of events that we detected by strength. So the first two bins label 10% and 25% of the cal. Uh, those are relatively weak bursts. We don't really, we don't have a high concern for 133 or the 90 in this case. Uh, that includes RMMA, 
weak uh, EMG bursts. It's just not something that we're terribly concerned about. The next three bins where we have the values of 35, 7, and 5, those values are represent clenches or grinds. They're events that we detected that meet the requirement of a clench or a grind. So in this case, this patient had 47 clenches or grinds. If we add 35, 7, and 5, we get 47. So the frequency in this patient is high. So their magnitude is average, slightly above average, with just over one on the strength, but their frequency is high. So this patient definitely clenches or grinds while they're asleep, and the, and the major vector that we see here that's positive is the frequency. Okay. The graph underneath at the bottom uh, is just a graph of their calibration. All right. Here's a graph that we thought I thought I thought would be interesting to share with you because it it's very positive for magnitude or strength, not so much frequency. So let me go through the graph. So the bruxism analysis, their biocal max force, that is when they're awake, what's the strongest they can do, and their value is 72 microvolts. And when they sleep, that night max force is 324. Okay, so they don't have a lot of them at that strength, but there is one or two that you can see that are kind of stick out. So the uh, what the very positive magnitude is actually 4.5. So masseter fires, it fires, you know, in a very profound way. With regards to the frequency, we have, what do we have here, 31, 32. I would say that that is moderate, mild to moderate with regards to frequency, but their magnitude is such that it's definitely, this patient has pair function without question. You can look at most of those clenches or grinds, and there are the 30 to 50 microvolt, which is just under what they, their max when they're awake, but they have a couple, you know, you do two or three at 300 or a night, you're, you're working. Positive for bruxism, really positive for magnitude. But what we learned about the Jim Pro through this is that this patient actually does not snore. You can look at their snore graph. I'm gonna talk about snoring in just a second. With regards to this particular patient, we, were, we actually could hear their teeth grinding. So if you look at that graph, it was interesting to see how the spikes are lined up perfectly, which tells us that we can hear the clenching and grinding. This leads me to believe that it's more grinding than clenching. But in any event, the fact that you could hear it, I thought was interesting to show you. Okay, this graph here, the final graph that we are gonna talk about is snoring. And this is a pretty simple graph. Uh, again, the colors are position, body position. This patient, a positional snore, that is they snore when they're in the red position or supine. Interestingly, in this particular patient, they have the gray, the dark gray is propped up, and the propping up seems to work. When they're flat, you can see that they snore. When they're flat on their back, they're snoring. When they're propped up, when it's gray, they don't snore. They don't snore much. So this is a person that I would encourage to use their, their what they're already doing and see if they can, you know, have a formal recommendation to prop themselves up. Okay. The middle graph where I labeled it normal, that's a normal graph of somebody that doesn't snore. You can see they sleep in a variety of positions, which we like to see. Uh, even when it, they have a little bit of time on their back, there really isn't any significant snoring. Um, I will point out in this graph, there's a, a, again, we have a graph with a dotted blue line. And during the, right before the patient goes to sleep, they hit a button and we listen to the room at the ambient room noise level, and then we make some calculations, and then we draw a line that says anything above this line is snoring. That dotted blue line is that line. Okay. The last graph I just thought was interesting. This is a completely saturated graph due to a profound or world class snoring. So the idea that this was the patient, I'll tell you, this was the dentist's first study, and he thought there was a problem. And I said, no, well, yeah, the problem is you have the mulatto snoring patient that I've ever seen. So this is what true snore looks like, okay? Okay, so that's essentially the explanation of our reports. And I'm gonna give you a little test. This is a very difficult question. 
it's if you get it, congratulations. It's it's not really a fair question, but I I like it because it illustrates some of the strengths to the Gem Pro report. So the question is, the patient when they're sleeping in the yellow position, when they're on their stomach, when you look at the SpO2 graph and the heart rate graph, they look almost normal compared to the rest of the other body positions. So there's two reasons somebody's this severe and then gets this normal. One is they're positional, or two is they're awake, okay? Now, looking at this graph, A or B, would you say this patient's awake, or is this patient positional? They, you have to look at all the graphs to be able to get the right answer. So I'll just wait a second. And I will tell you that this patient is positional. And the reason we know that they're not awake is if you look at the snore graph when they're yellow, this patient's snoring away. So waking people generally don't snore. So we do know that the patient is asleep because they're snoring. Um, however, their airway is functioning as good as it's gonna function when they're on their stomach. So even though they're snoring like mad, the idea that they're positional is definitely the situation here. The other thing to know is that if you look at the snore graph on this patient, it looks like a couple hours into the study, they're not snoring as much on their back. You know, they're still snoring, but it's not as intense. And you might think, oh, well, it's, geez, maybe they're not snoring as bad. And I can tell you almost in every case, the reason that that is, is their airway is closed. So they're not, it's not that they're not snoring, it's just there's no airflow. And you have to have airflow to snore, okay? So that's not good news. When you see severe oxygen desats and no snoring, there's nothing to get excited about. It's it's actually indicating that the patient's airway is completely closed and there's no airflow to cause snoring. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to just go through a couple of reports and talk about what the report means and what clinical decision can be made based on the GEMPRO report. To do this, I, I have done this enough. I have kind of a mental template. I call it a mental template. And when I look at a report, these are the questions that are in my mind it, that need to be answered in order to make a sound decision. Okay, first and foremost, the most important, why did you do the test? You're talking to your patient. You've had the patient fill out some forms or paperwork. Why did you decide that a test was indicated? Something triggered you to say this patient, patient should be tested. Why is that? Always have that in your mind. Okay, because you're as a dentist, you know, the patient comes in with a complaint, you deal with the complaint. If you find other things, that's great, but you always have to address the complaint. Number two, airway functionality, snoring, blood oxygen desaturations, what's going on there? Is it positional? Is it, it does a patient snore and not have desats, or do they snore and have desats, oxygen desaturations? And what role, number three, is parafunction? Are we dealing with a patient with worn teeth? Is that the primary reason that we're doing the test? Okay, the parafunction, remember, we're, we measure it on magnitude and frequency. Tooth wear. Okay, what's the visible damage that's been done as a result of the parafunction? Is bruxism as a result of the airway contributing to this? Okay. So if you see a positive parafunction report, that is either magnitude, frequency, or both are indicative that the patient is currently wearing their teeth because of parafunction, always check the calibration. The reason that I like to do that is because I just want to be sure that, that it gives you confidence that this data is sound. Okay. Number six, am I dealing with a patient that's complaint of snoring? Okay, now when that's the case, the patient will say, I see your sign there, you have people with snoring, and I snore, I'd like to not snore. Okay, when you say, sure, we've got a program just for you, let's send you home with the gym pro, let's see what's going on. And you get a report back. There's two things that you need to do that are really important. One, confirm that they snore, and on top of snoring, are there presence of oxygen desaturations, yes or no? If there's oxygen desaturations, they have a high likelihood of having sleep apnea. This is a medical issue. 
in the absence of oxygen desaturation and the presence of snoring, you can treat the patient as a dentist. Snoring is neither a dental issue or a medical issue. It's, it's a nuisance. And so if your patient's seeing you for snoring, you've done a Gem Pro study, and there's no evidence of oxygen desaturations and they snore, go ahead and make them or fabricate or have made a snore guard. Be sure you keep your report in the patient's record. And also number seven. Number seven gets overlooked a lot. And it's really, really important because we're dealing, we're exploring whether or not the patient has a sleep disorder. Number seven, explain the symptoms. Can you explain the symptoms? Okay, so you're due, your patient is, is seeing you and, and you've given them a form with some questionnaires to fill out. And if, based on the questionnaires, it indicates that they're tired during the day, they, they fall asleep or wish they could take a nap, and maybe they have some other symptom, tooth wear, for example. Okay, did my results explain those symptoms? If they did not, the patient should be referred out. OK, you should always, always be able to explain why you're ordered the test. If, if you have a reason to do the test and you didn't figure it out, then we need to we need to kind of escalate it because doing these gem pro studies and even home sleep studies, they have a range of sleep disorders they can evaluate. And there is a number of sleep disorders are out way outside that range. And maybe your patient's sleep disorder is outside the range and we need to get them to see a, a sleep professional in those cases, all right? And number eight, what's the disposition of the patient? Can I help them? Do I need to, to get a physician involved or do I need to refer them out? Okay, so this is the mental template. We're gonna apply this template to a couple of reports. Okay, here's a patient. The outcome is severe SPO desat desaturations, bruxism and snoring, so it's the trifecta. So if you look at the SpO2 graph, there are desets all over the place. You know, when you look at the SpO2, there really shouldn't be anything below the dotted blue line. Anything below the dotted blue line is just a, a high likelihood that the patient has. I mean, in one second, you could look at that graph and say, okay, listen, I need to get a physician involved, okay? Next step, look at that heart rate. Is there a lot of heart rate variability? Yes, there is, 60 to 144, you have 19 minutes, above 100, when you have that many oxygen desats, that's what you want to see. Okay, so this person is still fighting the fight every night. Bruxism. Okay, let, let's just be honest. When, when, when we see this severe oxygen desats, the bruxism kind of takes a back burner. It's not dismissed by any stretch, but we, have, we, we set a priority. Number one priority is, okay, we need to manage this patient's airway. All right, one way or the other, the number one priority is we, we have a patient that's not breathing well when they sleep, number one priority. The patient also has tooth wear, but let's focus on the airway first, all right? The patient snores profoundly. You look at the audio signal graph, that just kind of says, okay, listen, we really need to do something for this patient. It, it, it does lend credence to it because sometimes people will say, yeah, I do snore and look at that graph, I, I've confirmed, and they can hook into that. Sometimes oxygen desats are kind of outside what their carrier understands. So here's the outcome. Severe SpO2 desaturations, high likelihood of sleep apnea. They did have appropriate heart rate variation in this scenario, so that's kind of a good sign. They had bruxism, managed the airway first, snoring, managed the airway. So a order a diagnosis. Now that can be done a variety of ways. You know, if you have a, a, a diagnostic instrument in your practice, go ahead and order it. If you are working with a sleep lab, refer them to the sleep lab. Second report, I have a patient that says, geez, I snore. I saw a sign that says you can help people that snore. Here I am. Okay. So I said, great. I've got an instrument I'm going to send home with you. It's going to capture the nature of your snoring. And then we'll make some decisions on what's the next best step to manage your snoring. And you send them home with the, the Jam Pro and you come back and you sit down with this nice graph and this great report. And you say, okay, uh, good news. Uh, you're right. You do snore. So you're right you snore. The other good news is you had no desaturations below 89%. So it looks like your airway is functioning fairly well, notwithstanding the snoring. So let's look at, look at our options. Okay. 
The other thing about this report that I'd like to point out is the patient had very little parafunction, all right? And this plays a role in what you're gonna do in the clinical decision and the context. When you look at the bruxism, remember the two vectors are magnitude and frequency. And then both those vectors were well within normal limits. So the uh, biochem max force was 37, the night max force was 54, and we only had three events that could even be counted as anything significant. And that's so the frequency's very low, the magnitude's low. So how those, what this tells you is for your snore therapy, the, the guard is going to be under relatively low pressures. So that, that actually opens up some less expensive therapeutic options, okay? And by that, I mean, in, in a case where there's very little or no bruxism and there's snore only, no oxygen desats, we can treat that with, let's say, a silent night appliance or an EMA appliance, you know, one of the, the less costly uh, appliances for your patient. So the summary of this patient is snoring only, heart rate looked normal, their bruxism was normal, their snoring was obvious and profound, and so the outcome treat the snoring. We don't have to get a physician involved here. All right, so this study is, this is a tricky one, and so this is going to be the hardest one, and I will give you a little background on this particular patient. This is a patient that has a six-month-old baby, is you know, you know, beyond all the insomnia associated with that, she has a long history of being treated for sleep apnea. She has been diagnosed with upper airway resistance. She happens to live near a sleep lab that does a particular kind of monitoring. It's called pleural pressure monitoring or PES monitoring. And it measures uh, very accurately upper airway resistance. She's a 36-year-old fit woman. And her oxygen desats, her low desat was 91, which is great. So we know she has airway resistance. Uh, we know she's not having a lot of oxygen desaturation. Her heart rate looks fairly good. Her range is 44 to 88. Look at her bruxism. Okay. She has tremendously worn teeth, but we know why. All right. We, we know what's going on here. She has a 66 waking value and a 319 during the night. So her magnitude is off the chart. It's almost five. Remember, anything above one is, is uh, abnormal. And then you look at her frequency and it's what, 56, 77. So she has 77 clinches or grind. So we know why her she, she has severe wear. Okay, so we have a patient that has very little snoring very little oxygen desaturation. It's a previous diagnosis of upper airway resistance. She's on CPAP and can't deal with it. Okay, so the, the, she's looking for options. So in this case, we're, we're thinking about an oral appliance, but now we also know it has to deal with some profound bruxism pressures. So outcome is treat the bruxism and the upper airway resistance, okay? All right, last one. We, this is a two-night study. So one of the, the, the great things about the Gym Pro is that it is very inexpensive to use and it's very simple to use. So you can do a pre-test and a post-test. So you measure a patient, you collect some data, then you do something, and then you collect the data with the thing that you did. In this case, we had a patient that had very severe bruxism and wasn't wearing her guard and was complaining to her dentist that she was having to undo an implant and she didn't feel she had to pay for an implant but she wasn't compliant with her guard so the dentist said let's do a study without your guard and with your guard and let's see what's doing with the idea that we can confront the patient that she should wear a guard and thereby she wouldn't be paying for these expensive pairs okay so she had obvious bruxism and severe bruxism. Her magnitude and her frequency were very, very high. Her airway was good, but if you look at her study, it's kind of weird how it's kind of all over the place. This is indicative of a person that's not sleeping well. Now you look at her wearing her night guard. So the dentist made her night guard, kind of padded or embedded some wire mesh and posterior uh, 
and said, listen, here's the, uh, you know, this, this is a guard that I think will last do a study with you wearing this guard. And you can see that the SpO2 graph just looks more consistent. It looks like she sleeps better. You look at her heart rate. That's a traditional curve where you start high, you go low, and you kind of sit it at the bottom for the bulk of the night. This is a, a classic normal heart rate graph. But most interestingly, look at her bruxism. Completely alleviated the pressure off, the, off of her uh, bruxism while she slept. So our magnitude and frequency were completely managed. And so we showed the two reports with the idea that we would incentivize her when she wears her guard, her dentition is not under these outrageous pressures as when she doesn't wear the guard. And if she really doesn't wanna pay for these repairs anymore, wear the guard. And this was a, a, a nice way of letting the patient know that she had some ability to prevent further work on her, on her dentition. Okay, so I wanted to close with something that we at DDME provide our partners with that have a Gem Pro, is we offer a service contract and we can diagnose your patients for you. So if you have a service contract with your Gem Pro, give us a call, we'll use our equipment, we'll use our, our physicians, and for $250, we'll take care of everything on the diagnosis. And in a few days, you'll get a report from a board certified physician that says what your patient has and also provides you with some treatment recommendations that then you sit down with your patient and say, let's discuss your options on this medical issue. Okay, so we do have that service. If you're interested in getting your patient diagnosed, by all means, give us a call and we'd love to help you out with that. On top of that, I would also say you're going to, if you're going to take on the airway and you're going to want to treat the airway and just not refer out when you, when you detect it, but you say, okay, this is part of what I want to do. You will have to develop a relationship with the sleep lab because as you start testing these patients, some of them you're going to learn, you, you can't help. It's not indicated for an oral appliance to somebody that has severe sleep apnea. They need to try CPAP first. Okay. Just, just be aware that if you call us and decide that you want our assistance in diagnosing your patient, that does not preclude you from having to develop a relationship with the local sleep lab. You will need to do that as well. Okay. One last thing about the, the Knox T3 reuse. I love the device. I've been using it since it was introduced to the market. In my opinion, it's the best home sleep diagnostic instrument out there. And it has a bruxism channel, so we can track that as well. So there's a lot of uh, fold over from going from the Gem Pro to the T3 because they both record the surface EMG in the same way. Okay, so I wanted to thank you for watching this video. Here's our numbers to contact, 800-513-9337. Uh, it's our email address, contact at ddmeonline.com. And my name is Jeff Weiscarver, and again, thank you. Mm -hmm.